CR Wireless News. I'm Martha DeGrasse, and I'm here with our CR Wireless Editor-in-Chief, Dan Meyer, and our CR Wireless Test and Measurement Editor, Kelly Hill. We do not have the advantage of being in Barcelona, but we do have the advantage of a good internet connection, so we're able to bring you this video. We're going to start off with carrier news with Dan. Thanks, Martha. Definitely appreciate it. Yeah, I guess uh, the advantage is we're not there, so we do, have, like you said, have a good internet connection. Our, uh, our man on the street, though, Sean Kenny, uh, was not able to find an internet connection that was stable enough to do video, so uh, we are uh, taking his place here doing the, doing the video. But uh, yeah, so, so some of the news coming out of the show this, this year, obviously, Mobile of Congress is kind of the big, uh, I guess, the big mobile show of the year. Uh, and uh, again, a lot of news coming out of there, almost uh, too much news as always coming out of the show. But when it comes to the carrier space, uh, some of the bigger news that came out, at least that, you know, that I saw that came out of there, was uh, an announcement from Sprint, obviously a U.S. carrier making some news there in Europe. Uh, Sprint had announced uh, kind of some, some uh, uh, work with uh, Nokia and Ericsson in terms of bolstering its, uh, its current LTE network as it looks towards uh, the deployment of 5G services. So uh, it announced some, uh, some of its MIMO testing going on with, uh, with Nokia. Uh, using all the latest technology. And one of the things that was kind of interesting about it is uh, most of the MIMO news we've seen lately has kind of come from, you know, operators looking at their current spectrum deployment plans, which is usually you can use a 4x4, maybe an 8x8 MIMO kind of deployment. But what Sprint is looking to do with uh, Nokia is using a 64x64 uh, MIMO deployment, which they can do to an extent because uh, their current LT network uh, relies heavily on the 2.5 spectrum, which as you move up the spectrum bands, uh, the antennas required to support that can become smaller and smaller. And so with their ability to uh, use somewhat smaller antennas, uh, they could put more of those antennas uh, at a cell site or in a device uh, and then take advantage, uh, greater advantage of the MIMO technology uh, to get uh, theoretically higher data speeds and, and, and greater throughput. Uh, again, this is all still in the testing phase. Uh, they seem to be sh uh, indicating at the show that with the MIMO that they're using and also um, some other uh, advances in the, in the technology that they're able to get uh, gigabit speeds with their current L2 deployments, basically, which uh, I, which kind of matches what other carriers are saying with what they're trying to do as well in terms of really advancing the LTE standard to the LTE advanced standard and getting that gigabit speed uh, prior to the 5G deployments. Uh, so I, I guess the spread announcement to me was uh, significant in, in the fact that we are using this higher order of MIMO, which as as move towards 5G continues and the millimeter wave spectrum bands that people expect to use for 5G. Uh, again, we're talking really, really small antennas at that point. And if you can use uh, a great number of these antennas in a MIMO configuration, uh, it should, again, be able to support what are going to be these multi-gigabit you know, gigabit speeds for 5G uh, coming along the line. So, so to me, the spread news was, was significant in the fact that they are showing that you can use these really, really high orders of MIMO uh, in, in these higher bands. And it kind of paves the way, not just for spread, but for the rest of the industry to really kind of tap into uh, you know, the, the advantages of these, of these higher grades of, of, of spectrum to, to support 5G. So to me, that was kind of a, some big news out of there. Um, I also saw some, uh, I know at has been pretty aggressive and kind of updating its, its software plans. I think I've seen a lot of uh, news coming from various uh, uh, collaborations going on with at and and other carriers uh, in terms of, uh, you know, more support for virtualization for NFE and SDN support. So uh, it seems like uh, obviously 5G is, a big, is big news coming out of the show, but also the virtualization stuff has become a, uh, 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 pretty pretty compelling coming out of there. So uh, for me, that's been what I've seen so far at the, at the event. Again, uh, you know, whenever you're at the show, you might get some different views of things, but at least from kind of my perspective looking at it, those are some of the bigger items I saw coming out of the event. So uh, that's what I saw. Uh, I don't know if you want to, Martha, if you want to, uh, if you want to go to Kelly or not, but that's, that's, that's my kind of two cents is what I saw for sure. Yeah, but on the Sprint, on the massive MIMO, wouldn't there also need to be smartphones with all those antennas at some point? Oh, yeah, that, that's always the tricky part. That's the part no one wants to talk about. But, uh, yeah, for this stuff to all actually work in the real world, you will need devices uh, to make this work. Uh, Sprint did say that they have had uh, several devices on site uh, embedded with the, the 64 uh, by 64 MIMO technology. So uh, it was kind of vague on what they were actually showing off. I think I know Sean... Uh, I think was at the actual event itself. And so I think tomorrow we have Sean on, we'll get some more details on that. Uh, but yeah, that's, you know, down the road, that's going to be the biggest challenge is getting devices. Uh, and we start looking at these MIMO deployments and all these antennas, you will have to have something in the device to make that work. So uh, that will be, uh, you know, something for the smarter people down the road to figure out. But uh, yeah, that's going to be a big, a big challenge going forward with all of this is getting all those antennas, uh, that antenna support in the device itself. So we'll see how that, how that plays out. But uh, that's, you know, again, it seems like these things tend to get worked out at some point, uh, but that will be, that will be a big challenge, no, no doubt at all. Yeah, right. Actually, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting that Sprint is following this up because AT&T 
uh, actually announced uh, just a few weeks ago that they're doing an FDD massive MIMO. Um, they've got, uh, there's, I think, one or two trial sites for them and then another one for, Shen for Shenandoah. Um, so, you know, and that was in, I believe, I want to say 1.9, the PCS bands. Um, so, you know, it, this is, it, it's picking up. They're, they're trying the stuff out. And uh, from what I remember, they had seen some pretty significant results, both in terms of throughput and in terms of capacity. Um, in a couple of different scenarios, um, one in a more populated area and one in, in, in a little bit more of a, of a less dense uh, population area. Um, so yeah, it's, it's nice to see them pushing the envelope on these things. Yeah. Absolutely. And Kelly, what else do you have to share on the test and measurement front? Yeah, you know, um, well, 5G is huge. And, uh, and of course, the test guys are the ones who, you know, who really help the industry push that forward. And, you know, they're at the forefront of a lot of the R&D stuff. Um, you know, you can't develop it unless you can test it. Um, and so, you know, uh, Keysight, uh, I think, has, you know, has really come out with quite a few announcements. Uh, this week, they're working with ZTE, they're working with Huawei, they're also working with Samsung. Um, you know, they've been uh, inking 5G partnerships in terms of testing and development um, that date back to like 2014. And I think you're starting to see some of that payoff um, with the announcements this week that, you know, they're working on devices, they're testing base stations, they're supporting, um, you know, Samsung in, in, uh, in some of their development efforts. Um, you know, and a lot of them are sort of uh, Asia Pacific centric, and you know, so you can really tell that their their focus there uh, on the five G ecosystem is paying off. Um, you know, I, security is actually also um, one of the major focuses I'm seeing this week. You got Bureau Veritas um, announcing some new approaches to security testing, uh, Rodi and Schwartz as well, and so uh, so security. Uh, 5G and, and IoT, I think, uh, you know, are some of the major areas of focus that we're seeing in terms of test this week. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I think that we're seeing a ton around IoT. That's sort of what I wanted to focus on today. It seems like we're seeing a big movement towards trying to give operators and their customers ways to simplify their IoT deployments. Companies are using words like plug-and-play solutions, out-of-the-box solutions, um, Sierra Wireless uh, came out with, with, a, with a module that you know, they claim is globally operable with, with networks around the world. Um, Huawei also, um, they didn't exactly announce IoT modules, but their chip vendor Sequans announced that uh, Huawei would be announcing IoT modules. So that's almost the same thing. Um, and I noticed that, uh, again, with trying to integrate and simplify deployments for operators. Uh, Sequence has also integrated their modem now with a processor, so that you know, eliminates theoretically uh, several steps that a developer might have to take to put together hardware. Uh, and it's, it's gonna be quite competitive, I think, because you know, with, with LTE category M1 coming, a lot of the solutions that previously aggregated low power wide area networks or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi back to an LTE router and will now be able to use sensors and um, little LTE modems right on the, the devices that are being connected. Um, I don't think the price points are really going to be quite as low as they are for some of those lower power solutions, but they're getting closer and it, you know, it, it has, I guess, a more seamless connection to that robust LTE network that's going to be carrying the traffic eventually. So it'll be very interesting, I think, to see how it all plays out. I think AT&T and Verizon are both hoping to roll out nationwide IoT networks here in the U.S. this year, and they're, they're certifying chips right now for that, so that'll be big to see. Um, and we're seeing, you know, hardware vendors from really all over the ecosystem trying to, to set a stake in the ground. Uh, Dell, Dell's Gateway was uh, part of a big announcement yesterday that we heard out of NWC, and they're integrating a connectivity platform from Ossivy and sensors from Episensor to, again, they're calling it an out-of-the-box solution. So just back to that whole idea of, of trying to, to simplify something that we all know is, is still pretty complicated, but there's uh, a, lot, a lot of potential uh, revenue opportunities, really, with, with connecting more devices to the internet as, as the smartphone market matures a little bit. So. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Maybe I, I guess on that part of the, the simplicity part of this, because it does seem like I think we're all, I mean, we've been you know, following the IoT space for a long time, and I know you've been curbing it more from the chip side of things, which is the, a pretty important part of all this. And my, my concern is always that it does seem like it's getting kind of complicated out there. I mean, there's so many different standards when it comes to chips, 
uh, you know, I'm guessing that somebody who's looking to deploy is still a little bit concerned about, you know, am I going to pick the right path on this? And if somebody can come in with a solution that uh, maybe future proofs that to an extent, it seems like that would be a pretty uh, significant way to kind of ease, I guess, the, the tension or the other concern by, by companies getting involved in this. Because it does seem like a big market opportunity, but still we're kind of early and seems like there's so many different acronyms out there about which way to go. It does seem like that's kind of a, a pretty important part of all this. Yeah, no, I think you're right. We heard that last week. We had a, a carrier IoT case studies webinar, and that point came up more than once. Uh, you know, the, the LTE chip, Vendors are, are saying that that's exactly why companies should deploy on the LTE network and not worry with some of the dedicated IoT networks because the LTE networks aren't going anywhere. Um, at the same time, you know, we had people on the webinar asking questions about, you know, which, which standard will be interoperable between all these different um, protocols that y'all are talking about. So, so it's not, you know, future proof is part of it, but it's also interoperability because you know, there are some devices that people are going to want to connect that they're just never going to be able to justify the cost of putting a little LTE modem on it. They're going to have to use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or, or something else. So, so then they want to know, you know, among all those different ways to connect that, what's, what's going to be interoperable and what's going to ensure that I'm going to be able to have the, you know, the support of ultimately getting back to um, the Internet or the LTE network. Yeah. yeah, and again, not to plug our own event coming up, but there will be a lot more of this coming up uh, in about a month or so uh, than last time when we were hosting our own uh, IoT-focused uh, event. So uh, I'm sure if people want to get more details on that, they can go to the RCR site and, and link to that and see what we're going to have. But I'm sure we'll have more details on that going forward, too. But there are little shameless plug there. But anyway, sorry, Mark. That's right. Enterprise IoT Summit, March 28th. You've got a month to rest up from Mobile World Congress and then come to Austin. That's right. That's right. All right. Dan <laughs> Kelly, thank you all very much. Yeah. Thanks a bunch. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks for watching.